Liam Reardon has been a professor in the Department of History at the University of Maine, Orono, since 1997. He has published widely on the revolutionary era, including his 2007 book, Many Identities, One Nation, which is the subject of, his, of this lecture. Oh dear, what can the matter be? The urban early republic and the politics of popular song in Benjamin Carr's Federal Overture, published in the Journal of the Early Republic in the summer of 2011. And he has co-edited the Loyal Atlantic remaking the British Atlantic in the revolutionary era, published by the University of Toronto Press in 2012. He's currently at work on a comparative biography of five loyalists who lived all around the British Atlantic as a result of their opposition to the Patriot movement. He was a Fulbright scholar at the University of Glasgow in spring 2012, and he's on the board of directors of the Maine Humanities Council. So please help me welcome Liam Reardon. Well, thank you all for coming out in the first uh, dreary night of a long Maine winter. Uh, it was worse in Bangor, so uh, Portland is better in any number of ways, including better weather. Uh, it's a real treat for me to be here tonight. I really want to thank Anwar, particularly, and Liz Bennett, who are the major coordinators of uh, bringing me tonight. The talk this evening, as Anwar mentioned, is based on my 2007 book, Many Identities, One Nation, that focuses on cultural diversity during the long revolutionary period from about 1770 to 1830 in the Delaware River Valley around Philadelphia. Now, one of the dilemmas for a historian when talking about their own research is that I find so many of the details compelling that I risk going into too great length. So my goal in tonight's talk is to move relatively swiftly and to try to introduce the major points that I tried to communicate in a much more detailed way in the book itself, and then hopefully have some time for questions at the end that'll give us a chance to explore the subject a little bit more deeply. Understanding complicated events that occurred over 200 years ago requires that we engage our imaginations to place ourselves in a setting that is both familiar and foreign at the same time. The argument that I'll make this evening is that understanding the American Revolution from the perspective of the Philadelphia region is especially valuable given our contemporary sense of American society. For history, at its most fundamental level, involves a dialogue between the past and the present where our current concerns and interests are essential for informing our inquiry about the past. So the story of the American Revolution that I want to share with you this evening begins with a geographic recentering of how the revolution is usually remembered in popular American memory. Rather than focus on political or military events in Massachusetts or Virginia, I am concerned with the impact of the war and the revolutionary transformation for ordinary people in the Delaware River Valley, where attention to the importance of place in shaping experience is crucial. So to begin this, I want to start with a map of the 13 colonies that become the United States. And a generation of social historians has really remade our understanding of early American history and how we might best understand the colonial era by not focusing on the nation to come and also not focusing on the very different stories of 13 individual colonies, but instead to group them into four regions, each of which had a very distinctive social, economic, cultural, and political development. And my focus in tonight's topic is on the region identified in this map as the Middle Colonies, or the Mid-Atlantic, the uh, large region that has really two major areas of settlement, New York and Pennsylvania. And I'm going to focus more deeply on one particular corner of this larger Mid-Atlantic region, but the thing that makes this region different from New England or the Chesapeake or the Lower South is the diversity of European settlement that is there from the very start of the colonial era. So it's in this region that 
Dutch and Swedish colonization precedes English presence by 40 years, 80 years, even a century. And so from the very start of the colonial period, this is a place of great diversity. This mixed landscape in the mid-Atlantic is transformed over the course of the colonial era as different immigration arrives that changes it from its Swedish and Dutch origins. And the argument that I'll make tonight is that the revolutionary period in this era intersected with religious, racial, and ethnic differences in dramatic ways that restructured people's understanding of themselves, of their local communities, and of the broader national society that they participated in. Now, before turning to the revolution itself, I think it is worth asking a more basic question about what I mean by multiculturalism, the word in the title of tonight's lecture. And this is, I think, a potentially loaded term that can carry a wide range of connotations. Uh, Multiculturalism has different meanings in different national contexts. For instance, in Canada, since the 1970s, the federal government has pursued policies to enhance multiculturalism, climaxing with the Canadian Multicultural Act of 1988. In the United States, by contrast, there's no nationwide policy regarding cultural diversity. And the relationship of multiculturalism to the nation has been marked by considerable controversy. The longstanding vision of the US as a melting pot where cultural differences are altered through assimilation to mainstream norms stands in awkward relationship to, perhaps even in direct conflict with, multiculturalism as a value system that favors the preservation of difference. Now, in dealing with such a complicated issue, and particularly one that can raise passionate disagreement, I think that a historical understanding can prove particularly helpful, which returns me to the diverse mid-Atlantic region of early America settlement where I began. And I hope that in our closing discussion tonight, we can explore some of the contemporary implications of multiculturalism in the US, but I believe that a meaningful engagement with this issue must be informed by a recognition that multiculturalism has been a building block of American life long before 911, before the varied social movements of the 1960s and 1970s, and even before the new Southern and Eastern European immigration of the early 20th century that led US sociologists and philosophers to first use terms like ethnicity, and cultural pluralism to explain American society. Now, because cultural identity can have an unhealthy tendency toward vague abstraction, and because the study of history typically organizes itself on foundations of time and place, I ground my discussion on the origins of US multiculturalism quite tightly. We began with this general colonial map to provide a broad introduction to early American diversity, the defining feature of the mid-Atlantic region. But I want to focus our lens even more precisely in my talk by looking at the Delaware River Valley, the region surrounding Philadelphia, in the broad revolutionary period of the late 18th and early 19th century. So this map turns us to the region around Philadelphia. Philadelphia here appears relatively small in the center of the map, and the three communities that I focus attention on appear in bolder type. And these three places were chosen for intensive examination, in part because they're quite similar to one another. All were county seats, all played important roles in the small town hinterland surrounding Philadelphia. And I see them as crucial places in an agricultural society where towns integrated rural people, urban developments, and transatlantic occurrences as well. Two of the places that we'll be focusing on tonight, Newcastle, Delaware, and Burlington, New Jersey, were also the capitals of those colonies. All three were county seats. 
And eastern Pennsylvania, far to the north, up the Delaware River, is a bit different than the other two, settled quite a bit later by Europeans. And it was the site of the last Indian treaty in the Delaware Valley in the colonial period in 1776. Now, having set the stage broadly in terms of geography and the diverse cultural composition of the region, I'd like to set the story in motion with a closer look at each of these places through a metaphorical journey up the Delaware River, aided by an image from each place to introduce you to these particular communities. Our first stop heading north on the Delaware River is Newcastle. This uh, watercolor of the waterfront from 1797 highlights the rough and tumble character of this particular town. It was a provisioning port for ships exiting the Delaware River. So ships would come downriver from Philadelphia, stop here, take on all kinds of goods, add sailors. And one of the most significant things about this town that I'll be focusing on tonight is that it was about a third African American. And the black residents of Newcastle in the revolutionary period that we're focusing on tonight changes from being almost entirely enslaved to entirely free over the course of about a decade at the very end of the 18th century. So I think a very basic question for us to ask is what did this revolutionary era change mean for residents in Newcastle, Delaware? The second location is Burlington, New Jersey. Burlington, here we see in a 1797 uh, engraving of the town and depiction of the waterfront skyline. And unlike Newcastle, Burlington was a place of dramatic affluence. And indeed, just the fact that an artist lavished the time to make an engraving like this reflects his strategic thinking that there was a local clientele that would purchase this kind of print that would want to have it in their possession, hang it on their wall, have it in their library. Burlington is an old town founded before Philadelphia. It was the joint meeting place of the annual Philadelphia yearly meeting of the Society of Friends in this region. And it's the presence of this distinctive religious group, Quakers, that are going to be the focus of our attention in Burlington. And Quakers' relationship with the American Revolution is no less dramatic than that of African Americans in Newcastle who experienced a dramatic transition in their legal status because the Society of Friends decided that Patriots' strategies of using violence as a tool for social transformation were inappropriate and that members in good standing of the Society of Friends could not participate in the Patriot movement. So this meant that their religious self-understanding intersected with the most basic political and military developments of the revolutionary era in dramatic ways. Now our third location is Easton, Pennsylvania. As I mentioned, quite a bit further up the Delaware River settled quite a bit later than the other two towns. And this is also an image from the same 12-month period of the previous two images. Here we see the county courthouse in the center of Easton, Pennsylvania. And this image appeared in a Pennsylvania magazine that was part of a sort of Chamber of Commerce booster article talking about the promise of Easton, Pennsylvania and how it would be transformed in the next generation. And part of what this article emphasized was that the previous era of frontier wilderness and basic backward development was about to be left behind as Easton was going to join in the economic development of and the prosperity of the new United, States, new United States. Here, the majority of settlers were Pennsylvania Germans, and their local contribution to the Patriot movement during the Revolutionary War was crucial to their heightened self-consciousness in the post-war era and new claims that they made about their centrality to American society. Now, I want to 
take a closer look at each of these cultural groups that I've introduced you to, starting in Burlington, New Jersey, in what I would call the colonial center of the Delaware Valley. And I think this is one of the most basic elements of the history of the Delaware Valley that has been forgotten largely because of the success of the Patriot Movement and the way in which the American Revolution forced members of the Society of Friends from the center of political power in this region. I think for many people, we often think of Quakers as highly distinctive, as very unusual, at the fringe of the American Protestant religious tradition. And in many respects, this is true. Quaker religious beliefs are highly distinctive and did lead them to a radical set of beliefs about how to carry themselves in the world that were far different from almost every other Protestant group in early America. You know, Maybe the most dramatic example might be that Quakers in this era thought that women could speak with equal religious authority to men. This is shocking for the late 18th century. Or so too, to have a religious commitment to pacifism in the 18th century was to take a stand that was unmanly by very basic English and Western understandings of what it meant to be a man. So what's significant then is that this radical religious group was at the very center of the political and legal order of the Delaware Valley until right up to the start of the Revolutionary War. And the Revolutionary War pushes Quakers from power in very dramatic ways. Now, I'd like to briefly talk about two particular members of the Society of Friends in Burlington, uh, Samuel Allenson and Margaret Hill Morris. And my reason for mentioning these two individuals to you in a bit more detail is because I also want to make the point that although they both were very pious Quakers and very dedicated in their commitment to the Society of Friends, they also are very different from one another. And one of the dilemmas of talking about cultural identity and group identity is that we run the risk of treating these groups as if they are homogenous blocks, as if there's one way of being Quaker in the revolutionary era, or one way of being African American. And Samuel Allenson and Margaret Hill Morris, who both understood themselves uh, as deeply Quaker, both Burlington residents, knew one another, but they had very different understandings of how being a member of the Society of Friends led them to act in the world. And Allenson is a particularly interesting individual because he took the radical implications of being a member of the Society of Friends and applied them to his life in very dramatic ways. He becomes a early leader of the anti-slavery movement in the United States, is really pushing at the front edge of anti-slavery commitments within the Quaker Delaware Valley. And many Quakers agreed with him about this in the late 18th century, well in advance of most other Americans. But there was another belief of Samuel Allenson's that was more radical and that upset many of his Quaker colleagues, including his cousin, who wrote him a bunch of letters to say, Samuel, what are you doing? You are just causing trouble for us. Can't you just shut up and get along and quit bringing abuse upon us? Because Samuel Allenson insisted that Quakers should not pay taxes during a time of war. And he said he recognized that Quakers in the past had done this, but that the American Revolution, he said, was bringing new scrutiny upon us as a group. And it is leading more people to understand what our values are. And so it's crucial now that we take the next step and refuse to pay taxes that are going to be used in a cause of warfare. Now, Margaret Hill Morris was a very different kind of Quaker. She was not 
the kind of intense reformer that Samuel Allenson was, but both would find that their lives were overturned by the way in which the American Revolution made new demands upon who they were and how they lived their life. So the revolution intrudes on their most personal and interior sense of self and brings a heightened public significance to their understanding of themselves as friends. Now, I want to move to Easton and talk a bit about this religious building in Easton, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's known as a Union Church. This is a widespread colonial institution in areas where German speakers settled, like Easton. And it was a single church building that was shared by two different religious congregations. So it represents a union of the Lutheran and German Reformed congregants in the town of Easton. Again, this kind of a union church is widespread in Pennsylvania, parts of Virginia, throughout the large region where German speakers settled in early America. The congregation was active here since the mid-1740s, the stone church built in 1772, and a brick tower and steeple added in 1832. Like the Quaker Meeting House in Burlington, this religious building still stands and is in use today as the United Church of Christ, the descendant of the German Reformed congregation of the 18th century. But as I've mentioned, in the revolutionary era, this was a shared church building by two congregations where their theological differences were less important than what they shared as German speakers and through their sense of ethnic allegiance. Now, the revolution brought dramatic changes to Pennsylvania Germans as well. And in this case, I think the changes that come are a little bit more complicated than the kind of Quaker persecution that's relatively easy to understand with how pacifistic Quakers would have found themselves outside the bounds of an emerging patriot demand for conformity in the revolution. So I want to show a couple of different images to suggest some of the nuance of German ethnic and linguistic identity in this period and how it begins to change. This is a uh, color painting of a kind of domestic drama by a carpenter and folk artist named Lewis Miller, who recorded a particular cultural clash in 1806 between the individuals in this picture. We see a Pennsylvania German countrywoman on the far left scolding a somewhat awkward looking man in the center. And then on the far right are two women dressed in sort of the latest Anglo fashions of cosmopolitan Philadelphia. And it would be difficult to interpret this image, except that Lewis Miller, the artist, has added a caption along the bottom in Pennsylvania Dutch dialect that helps to explain what's going on. And so this tells us that the old Gretel is scolding her husband Joseph with her raised index finger and switch clasped behind her ba back. And below the two women in long dresses on the right, Miller has added a title in English identifying them as strumpets. So here we have Anglo culture as embodied by these promiscuous women who would require disciplining and censure in Pennsylvania German areas. Now this sexualization of ethnic difference we see reversed in a sense, where it's the English norm that is being depicted as the outsider and in need of censuring. And so this is to reverse our typical lens of thinking of early American society. Many people think early America must have been dominated by Englishmen, if not Puritans, but that's not the case in major areas of settlement in the mid-Atlantic region. In the local area around Easton, it's really German speakers who have the dominant culture in the region. 
Now, if this suggests a somewhat subtle and nuanced kind of conflict centering around ethnicity and gender and sexuality, there are other more dramatic examples of the way in which a growing sense of Pennsylvania German ethnicity expressed itself in the political debates of the late 18th century. Uh, one of the most dramatic of these occurs in an event known as the Freeze Rebellion, which explodes in the area outside of Easton in the late 1790s that led a group of German speakers to be arrested by federal marshals. They decide they won't have a trial for them in the Easton area because everyone there supports the rioters. So instead, they're brought back to Philadelphia where they're going to have a trial for tax resistance. And this uh, document that we have on the slide is, again, in Pennsylvania German dialect. And it announces, along with a sketch of a rifle and a broadsword, that these are the weapons of your slaughter. And this was given to the federal tax collector who was charged with assessing local German households in this region that sparked this dramatic incident of popular unrest that had deep ethnic and linguistic roots in the Pennsylvania German community. Now, a final image I want to show about Pennsylvania Germans in Easton, before I move on to my final case study, is to look at two examples of Pennsylvania German folk art. And one of the things that I discovered in doing the research for this book is that ethnic identity often expressed itself in non-textual or non-linguistic ways. So looking at uh, clothing patterns, food ways, architectural traditions, or in this case, a highly distinctive Pennsylvania German form of folk art. So fracteur refers to the broken script style of uh, lettering that is sort of associated generally with Central Europe in this era. And a tauschein refers to a birth and baptismal certificate. And this is a very distinctive genre of Pennsylvania German religious, ethnic, and linguistic expression that has roots in Central Europe in this era, but is clearly different from those German traditions. It's really something that is part of a dynamic ethnic expression that's being created in the greater Pennsylvania area in the late 18th. Uh, through the late 19th century. And in fact, the overwhelming majority of Pennsylvania German, sometimes called Pennsylvania Dutch, folk art that survives today comes from exactly this late 18th, early 19th century revolutionary era. The explosion of this kind of ethnic expression through folk art is a sign for us of the new place in American society that Pennsylvania Germans were asserting for themselves and trying to maintain a sense of self in engagement with broader American society. Now, the reason that I chose these particular baptismal certificates to share with you is that they also highlight for me an aspect of folk art that I think is often underappreciated. A lot of times, folk art is thought of as something that's sort of a, a last expression of a distinctive cultural tradition that's just about to disappear. And so there's a kind of interest in collecting it and preserving it so that we have a documentary record before this ethnic group is gone and no longer exists. And I want to suggest to you that just the opposite is the case for Pennsylvania Germans in the first half of the 19th century in this region. Uh, the birth and baptismal certificate on the top left is sort of a classic example of this genre, uh, all hand lettered, all in Pennsylvania German dialect, has a very formulaic set of language, identifies the birth date and name and parents and godparents and the minister who performed the baptism. 
And this is the kind of uh, Tao shine that's you know, sought after and collected by collectors today. But what's more interesting to me in a sense is the example we see at the bottom right of the screen, because this is a Tao shine that is mass produced and printed by the German language newspaper printer in the town of Easton. And if we look carefully, we can see that the hand-lettered one is actually a direct copy of the one that was mass produced by the newspaper printer. So he made thousands of these forms that are then sold to artists who might be, who would do the coloring, who would add in a very careful calligraphy often the name and the particular identity of these individuals. This was such a widespread popular form that Courier and Ives will mass produce them in the late 19th century in both German and English language versions as Pennsylvania German culture is asserting itself well within the mainstream of what American society would be in the middle and late 19th century. Now, the final uh, example that I'd like to talk with you a bit about tonight is in Newcastle, Delaware. And here, the religious group that I'd like to focus on does not have a surviving religious building from the period in the way that all of the other religious groups in these towns, including several that I haven't emphasized in my lecture tonight, uh, all the other ones have surviving religious buildings from this period. And this is a reminder to us that sometimes even the physical landscape can be misleading for us. Right? We know, thanks to census data, that a third of the population of Newcastle, Delaware in this era was of African descent. But their religious practices have not been preserved on the landscape from this era the way that other groups were. Now, fortunately, a traveler who came to Newcastle one day in 1806 found himself stranded on the Sabbath because the stagecoach wouldn't run on that day by state law. And he ends up attending a religious service at the Union Church of Africans in Newcastle. One of the first things that occurs when African Americans acquire new status as freed people is that they established a Protestant church for themselves that had this very striking name. Right? They called themselves the Union Church of Africans. Now, I think in our own day, we're often conscious of changing terminology for ethnic and racial groups. Should people of African descent in the US be called black? Should they be called African American? Is the word Negro acceptable anymore? And so if that can raise some sensitivities even in the last decade in the United States, imagine what it meant for a people years after leaving their enslaved legal status behind to publicly announce themselves as the Union Church of Africans. I mean, here was a extraordinary public statement about personal identity, about commitment to being African in public space. And I think it's an insistence upon a place within a Protestant republic where they deserved greater equality. Now, this white visitor to the service of the African Union Church in 1806 did not understand the Union Church of Africans in those terms. Rather, he described a out of control evangelical service that comes to a climax in his account with the white sailor that he is accompanied to the service falling on the ground in religious ecstasy and then being laid on by the minister who calls out for him saying, you cannot serve two masters, a sort of classic scriptural injunction, to which the sailor replies, no, that's wrong. 
I serve three masters, the captain and the first mate and God. And this visitor records that this made the whole congregation laugh and the service broke up on those terms. Now, this observer's derogatory explanation of what went on and his explicit statement of the minister practicing buggery on the person that he climbed on top of is very similar to the account of black evangelicalism that we see in this image of a Philadelphia religious service from the exact same period. And there were great fears among white Americans in this era that the new style of enthusiastic evangelical religion did not represent proper religious practice, that this was a licentiousness, that this is an out of control sort of behavior that needs disciplining and prohibition in order to have a healthy republic. And I think it doesn't take much imagination to see the central figure of the woman in this image being depicted not as a religious service tumbling out of the door of this African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, but rather as an orgy. Now, clearly, this was not the self-understanding of African-American participants in the Union Church of Africa. Rather, they saw their black Protestantism as a assertion of respectability, of participation as equals in the new republic created by the American Revolution. So it's this second image, also of a Philadelphia black congregation from this same era, that is the one I'd like to have you leave in your mind's eye, that this reflects what the Union Church of Africans aspired to in its own religious practices. And we have one of the few surviving documents from this congregation is a hymnal that they published in 1822. And the introduction to the hymnal emphasized the importance of singing with spirit, but that the singing with spirit needed to have understanding as well. And I think this emphasis on understanding highlights the bid for respectability that we see for black Christians in this image of a Philadelphia black church from the 1820s. The last, this is very difficult to see, but one of the nice things about this image, it has a marble uh, inscription, a sort of tablet at the very top of the image under the fan window that announces this as the African church. So again, like the Union Church of Africans, this bold, public statement of who they were simultaneously Christian and African as they forge a new place for themselves in the multicultural United States. Now, I'll bring the lecture portion of tonight's talk to an end with, uh, by highlighting some of what I think is most important in understanding the American Revolution from the perspective of the Delaware Valley and also suggest for you some of the broader arguments that I make in the book from which this lecture was taken. First, I want to emphasize the importance of considering how multiple groups intersected with one another. That is that we need to think about religious and racial and ethnic identities interacting with and reshaping one another in close relationship. Second, we've examined broadly shared politicization of the public consequences of personal identity as part of the revolutionary mobilization, whether for Quakers, Pennsylvania Germans, or African Americans. Now, I'm not saying that each of these groups experienced this new public awareness of the consequences of their distinctive identity in the same way. In fact, part of what's important to understand is the different ways that their self-understanding and group identity was transformed. But I think what is also important to recognize is this shared trajectory that for all of them, 
being Quaker, being Pennsylvania German, being African American had new meaning with new kinds of consequences as a result of the revolutionary mobilization. And it's also important to note that this politicization of personal identity has not been widely recognized as a fundamental component of the American Revolution. And I think an important part of this oversight has to do with the way in which this politicization triggered a reaction in the 1820s. And this goes beyond the bounds of what I can talk about in tonight's lecture. But both the development of partisan politics and of conservative Christian reform movements in the 1820s explicitly sought to moderate the kind of religious, racial, and ethnic diversity that was exploding as a result of the revolutionary movement, and instead to channel it in certain forms that were deemed publicly acceptable, but while others were denied such legitimacy. Thus, the broader book than this talk traces a cycle in the development of revolutionary political culture from 1770 to 1830 that remains potent in American life as we struggle to come to terms with the meaning and significance of multiculturalism in US society today. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please use the microphone, yeah. I think so there are people watching on web oh, okay. streaming and other forms, so we want to use the mics if we can. Interested in the, the African community, the f first part of the question, how did they come to pick that area to, to, uh, to start their community? And second, did they have some representation in the politics of the, of the Congresses uh, uh, of the colonies when they were evolving? So there, there's very little volition on the part of people of African descent of where they're living in this time. Right? They're overwhelmingly, obviously, they almost all come as enslaved people. And in the particular town that I study in the 1770s, they all are initially there as enslaved people. And this is really a tremendous borderline because the state of Delaware, where Newcastle is located, will retain slavery as a legal institution until the Civil War, whereas Pennsylvania is one of the pioneering states to begin to initiate gradual emancipation laws in this period. And so Newcastle, Delaware, located in the northern part of Delaware, is in a part of the state that even though slavery is still legal, it increasingly does not, is not a viable economic option. So we see this transition even though it remains a slave state until the end of the Civil War. Um, and I, so I think one of the significant points here is, has to do with the creation of black religious institutions immediately on the heels of this transition to freedom. And of course, we'll see it again in the post-Civil War era throughout the South as well, uh, underground black religious tradition that is able to become much more public and much more viable once slavery is ended as a legal status. Did, there was a second part to your question I think I missed. For the most part, no, there was no political representation, no voting rights for African Americans in this era. It is much debated, and it becomes a real flashpoint in the gradual emancipation debates that occur. And many opponents of anti-slavery, that is many pro-slavery arguments say, well, look, we're a republic. If you grant them freedom, if they pay taxes, you're going to have to give them the vote. And this is a powerful argument against ending slavery from the point of view of that particular perspective. There is some evidence that some African Americans with property are able to vote in New Jersey and Pennsylvania in this period. And I think this is actually a crucial 
part of the story of the revolutionary mobilization of black consciousness in this era because it remains an open possibility until the 1820s and 1830s. And at that point, state constitutions get rewritten to explicitly state that voting rights are only for white citizens. So it's at least ambiguous in the 1780s, 1790s, 1810s, and revisions to the laws in the 1820s make plain that it is a white republic. And so this opening potential, the kind of bid that respectable African Christians hope to make to participate more fully, gets turned back very sharply by the 1820s, definitely one of the tragic outcomes of a development that might have had a very different trajectory. This one of the most poignant examples of this uh, came in the minutes of a colored people's association that had representatives from all the three towns that I study. And they said at one point in their minutes from the late 1820s, we have to strike the word African from the marbles of our churches. Right, that by the late 1820s, they had made a sort of strategic decision that this was just going to open them up as targets of abuse and punishment. So rather than publicly state it the way the Union Church of Africans did, the way this particular engraving does with the marble on the top, there was a sense that a different sort of strategy was going to be better for the collective health of the black community by the late 1820s. First, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, really <clears throat> found it very uh, enlightening. You mentioned that the, <clears throat> in the, by the 1820s, the African Americans had started to strike the idea of African from their identity. <clears throat> Was this also true of the Germans and of other people as well, that before the revolution, did they think of themselves and speak of themselves as Germans? I am German, just as the Anglos would say, I am an Englishman. But after the revolution, how long and how many generations did it take for them to start speaking of themselves and thinking of themselves as American or as something other than I am a German, I am an Englishman? Mm -hmm. uh, how long did it take? So there, I think there are a couple of questions embedded in your, uh, in your comment. And one of the points I'd make is that I think for all three of the main groups that I focused on, they experienced significant turning points in the late 1820s in terms of their self-understanding. So I mentioned the sort of backlash against African Americans in their bid for equality. There also are important divisions among Pennsylvania Germans where that Union Church building that had been shared for six or seven decades, by, the, by 1830, the two congregations decide to separate and to no longer share a single church building. The Lutherans remove themselves and build you know, the grandest church building in any of the three towns that I study and have a sort of new place for themselves for their worship. And I think this says something to us about the dynamic process of group identity, that there had been a transition from a colonial era when being a German speaker in Pennsylvania was very much to be an outsider, to be someone on the margin of political practices and legal practices that are all done in English. And by the 1830s, Lutherans in Easton have established a public presence for themselves, have acquired uh, wealth that allows them to really have a sort of break within a Pennsylvania German ethnic and religious tradition and to say, we don't really need the Union Church now in a way that we did in this preceding period. So I think there's a sign of some accomplishment there and some confidence, but also a sign of some tension and a breaking apart of what had been a longstanding shared institution. 
I think that the consciousness of Pennsylvania Germans as Americans really are not exclusive ways of thinking about self until World War I. And I think the persistence of this, of not being troubled by being Pennsylvania German and American is a fundamentally American story that really doesn't get suppressed until World War I and, of course, World War II as well. Quakers have a similar kind of trajectory. There's also a major schism in the Society of Friends in the late 1820s, late 1830s. It has to do with some very specific theological issues, but more broadly, I think, like the Pennsylvania Germans, it has to do with the relationship between Quaker identity and a growing power of a certain mainstream American Christianity. And some Quakers were more interested in participating in that. Others wanted to have a more distinctive Quakerly expression of self. And this ends up splitting the Society of Friends for over a century. They're not unified again until the 1930s or 1940s. At the beginning of your lecture, you briefly touched upon the Native Americans. So I was curious, what was their place in society, if any? Well, I think this is definitely one of the most troubling aspects of early American history. Because even, you know, obviously slavery is a tremendously terrible institution and has a legacy that we continue to struggle with in the United States. But Africans and African Americans, because of the centrality of slavery to colonial and early American society, are really deeply integrated with American society in ways that Native Americans largely were not. And so their presence in the three communities that I examine is very minimal. Uh, now, all three of these communities are literally built on top of places that had been native communities. They are all at you know, river intersections that were trading locations that were picked because they were good places to settle to trade with native people in those initial phases of colonization. And so in focusing on the revolutionary era, we get just a glimpse of that in the town of Easton that still has a frontier sort of setting in the middle of the 1770s. And Easton's particular history of being a site of the appropriation of native land is particularly explosive. And this was really the site of searing disagreements in the 1750s and this famous walking treaty purchase that is a sort of land swindle by which colonists seize much more land than had really been agreed to in a treaty document. By the time the revolution starts, as it's really the period I specialize in, that is already a generation in the past. And so there is this final Indian treaty where natives come to Easton and actually meet in the Union Church, which is the largest church building in uh, Easton in 1776. The negotiations happen here. But the only other significant Indian event in Easton in the Revolutionary Era is that Easton becomes a staging ground for a major invasion of Iroquois in 1778 and 79. So it's a story that lacks, you know, from the perspective of these three communities, there's not a similar story of cultural persistence and awareness of Native American identity as making a bid to be a part of the kind of post-war revolutionary society that's going to be created. To show the depiction of the blacks coming out of the church, was that just a, the church of the blacks, or was that happening throughout other sects 
of the different religions. And I read a little bit about how there was a, a movement prior to the Revolutionary War in New England. Um, and it was partially religious and partially a kind of a striking out against the landed aristocracy, which kind of ran the churches. So is that all in the same, or are those two different movements? I think they are related to one another. And this, I mean, you know, one of the interesting things about religion is that it transgresses all kinds of worldly boundaries. And in particular, this is an era of dramatic religious transformation that is occurring sporadically and constantly and varying by place and varying by tempo. But there is a great deal of concern about the popularity of a new enthusiastic evangelical understanding of Protestantism. And one of the explicit concerns that's articulated by leading people in Philadelphia in particular is that they see this movement that's particularly led it by African Americans having great popularity among laboring whites. And that this is really seen as a threat to the virtue and the health of the republic. So evangelical religion knows no particular, you know, religion in general knows little boundaries by cultural group. And this is certainly one of the dynamics that is called to the fore in you know, images like this one that depict evangelical religion as out of control and dangerous and not something that's going to be healthy for the republic. Um, it seems to me that the westward movement that was occurring at this time must have some connection with this. Well, the Missouri Compromise, you mentioned the 1820s as a, a kind of a turning point. And here's Maine coming in as a free state, so we, we certainly can relate to that. And Missouri as a slave state. Missouri, where a real center of uh, German and Lutheran starts to occur, so you almost see, uh, I'd like your comments on this, almost see a, a transition that, that has some, Im is impacted in some way by the movement toward the West, the expansion. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sympathetic with that argument because ultimately I'm not really interested in understanding and studying these three small particular communities just for their own sake. I do think the careful focus on the particular religious, racial, and ethnic groups in these places help us understand a broader dynamic that's really fundamental to American society. You know, and this is part of sort of the regional argument that I make about why I think careful attention to the Mid-Atlantic is really valuable because I think it experiences the kind of mixed landscape, the heterogeneous society that we are familiar with in American society today much earlier than other regions of early America that have been the subject of more intensive scholarship and of greater popular understanding. So as much as I love teaching in New England, and I'm happy to be an early Americanist at the University of Maine, I wonder about the Puritan story as a metaphor for all of early America being really misleading. And by the same token, you know, studies of the slave societies of the Chesapeake and the Lower South are really important and help us understand a lot about a black-white racial dynamic in American history that is ongoing and powerful. But it also, if we're studying a place where slavery is legal, we're also studying a society that's so different from the rules that we now have in effect that I wonder the utility of that as a particular region for careful scrutiny and public attention. 
So to me, the mid-Atlantic with this variety of cultural groups that are competing and interacting and changing, this to me is really the most intriguing model for thinking about what is contemporary society today in the United States and our sort of globalized future. I think this gives us the, a particularly rich and rewarding area for close attention. Thanks. I really enjoyed your uh, comments, uh, references to some primary documents, and I was wondering what other documents did you find really helpful in your research? Well, so my approach in this project was a comparative community study. And so I selected these three places for a variety of reasons, and one of the advantages of this tightly bound unit of study in you know six decades, not a huge period, but not a short one either, was that I, I really tried to look at as much surviving material from and about these places as existed. So I looked at huge amounts of personal manuscripts, letters and family papers that are preserved in local historical societies. It was all, now those kinds of papers typically are obviously all written by literate people, tend to be saved by wealthier families that have some kind of personal libraries that last or that get donated to state historical societies. So to complement that manuscript research and personal papers, I also did a very robust social history that looked at other kinds of quantified records. So, I compiled a tax list, uh, a database that used tax list, census records, and church records and tried to correlate them so I could look at changes in wealth and religious status and demography over the six decades that I was studying. And then a final broad category is that surviving material culture was particularly crucial to teasing out many aspects of this kind of cultural identity. So surviving architecture, surviving paintings, the kind of folk art. Uh, I really tried to newspapers, uh, large numbers of newspapers that are particularly important for the development of partisan politics in the 1820s become important in the study later. So I tried to do everything. <laughs> um, you've done a lot. Thank you so much.